there are some people that everyone should know about, and one of those people is Jack Churchill. But before we get into Jack's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you come to the right channel because that's all we do, and we upload three or four times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please invite the like button to come out with you for a nice casual get-together, and when you're about halfway through dinner, start aggressively hard-selling your multi-level marketing scheme. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's story. Jack Churchill graduated from one of the UK's most prestigious military academies called Sandhurst, thus becoming an army officer. His first assignment was to an infantry unit stationed in Burma, but when he got there, it was peacetime, so Jack didn't have much to do. But instead of just sitting around all day, Jack did what any other restless young military officer would do, and he mastered the bagpipes, despite being 0% Scottish. He also took a trip across the entire Indian subcontinent on his motorcycle, almost entirely on unpaved roads. But in 1936, despite these incredible side hobbies, he just wasn't really that interested in being a part of the military when there wasn't anything going on, and so he decided to get out. He moved to Nairobi, Kenya, where he became a newspaper editor slash male model slash movie extra. During his off time, he still took his bagpiping very seriously, placing second in a prominent piping competition in 1938. He also picked up another hobby, archery, and he became so good at it so quickly that he was chosen by England to represent them in the Archery World Championships in 1939. Later that same year, when World War II broke out, Jack decided now's a good time to get back into the army. So he rejoined the army and he was promptly sent to France to help defend their borders against a potential Nazi invasion. But shortly after Jack arrived, Hitler was able to push through those defenses and he launched a brutal Blitzkrieg campaign against the Allies in France. Blitzkrieg is a military tactic that's basically an all-out attack all at once with everything you got. So planes, tanks, artillery, infantry, you just send all of it in an attempt to overwhelm your enemy before you run out of resources. And in this case, Hitler's Blitzkrieg was successful. In just six weeks, they not only invaded France, they conquered it. But during that six-week battle for France that the Allies ultimately lost, Jack made a name for himself by employing two particular weapons that nobody else in World War II was using. He is the only one who used these weapons for the entirety of World War to. Jack and two other infantrymen were up on this hill overlooking this town that was full of Nazis, and at some point, five Nazis come running out to the edge of this town, and they duck behind a wall that's about 30 meters away from Jack. And one of these Nazis stands up and quickly crumples to the ground. And his four Nazi comrades look to see what happened to him, and they see a dead man on the ground with the back end of an arrow jutting out of his chest. And that arrow was fired by none other than Jack Churchill, because for the duration of World War II, he didn't carry gun. He didn't need a gun. Instead, he carried a bow and arrow and a long broadsword. Although periodically he would scoop the weapons up off of dead enemy soldiers and he would fire those. When asked why he didn't just carry a gun in the first place, he responded, any officer that goes into action without his sword is improperly dressed. From then on, he became Mad Jack and his peers loved him, but his leadership hated him. They said he was setting a terrible example that no one should be running around with a sword and a bow and arrow. But he was so effective, they let him continue. Throughout the brutal six-week battle for France, Jack would lead dozens of these small raids against the Nazis, and he would just pick them off one by one with his bow and arrow and with his sword. And in one particular raid, he got shot through the neck, but he was so nonchalant about it that when he got back to base, someone was like, hey, Jack, you're bleeding. And he was like, oh, yeah, I am. They were like, well, what happened? He's like, ah, machine gun. After the Allies finally lost this battle for France and were forced to evacuate, they found a diary from one of the British soldiers, and in it, he talks about the one thing that motivated him and the other troops around him, and that was the sight of Mad Jack running hither and thither with his bow and arrow and his broadsword. For his bravery in France, Jack was awarded the Military Cross. After leaving France, Jack heard about this new unit, the commandos, that was being stood up to aggressively sabotage Nazi operations, and they were looking for volunteers. Then Jack 
Jack didn't know much about what they were going to do, but they promised combat, and so he was all for it, and he volunteered. The commando unit would go on to become the famous British Special Forces, and the training they put Jack and the other volunteers through was absolutely brutal, and Jack just loved it. He loved being in the commandos. After graduation in 1941, Jack was put in command of a commando unit that was tasked with going to this Norwegian town of Vogsoy and taking down a Nazi garrison there. And so they loaded up into their amphibious landing craft and Jack's got his kilt on and he's got his bagpipes and he plays the bagpipes on the entire transit over to Vogsoy to pump up the commandos. And then Jack's landing craft was the first to reach the shores and when its ramp came down, Jack was the first off and he just kept playing his bagpipes despite the fact that the Nazis now see them and they're shooting at them. So rounds are impacting around him as he's blaring his bagpipes and only when he finished his song did he shoulder his bagpipes, pull out a grenade, he saw some Nazis running along the ridge line, he throws a grenade at them and pulls out his sword and runs into battle. In just a few hours, the Nazi garrison had fallen and Jack was awarded his second military cross. During the Italian amphibious landings in 1943, Jack again was in charge of a commando unit and they were tasked with capturing a Nazi observation post that was in this town just outside of Salerno. It was well defended and fortified and Jack and his men were outnumbered 20 to 1. So Jack came up with a genius plan. Instead of using stealth tactics, he broke his small team into six different groups and he placed them all around the outside of this town. And it was nighttime so the Nazis did not see them setting up. And then on Jack's call, he had them all yell out at the exact same time, COMMANDO! And the Nazis in the town were so caught off guard by all this yelling coming from all around them, they assumed a huge force is coming to take over this town. And so they went on the defensive. And so after their big war cry, Jack and his group were the first to charge down into this town, and Jack and one other guy would actually splinter off, and they would discover this big group of Nazis that were setting up their mortars. And so Jack and this guy sneak up behind one of them, and Jack grabs him from behind, holds his sword to his throat, and orders him to tell the rest of the team to surrender. And so the rest of the team, who vastly outnumber Jack and the other guy, they turn around, and they see this lunatic wearing a kilt, wielding a sword. He's got bagpipes slung over his shoulder, along with a bow and arrow, and they're like, okay, we give up. Shortly after, the rest of the Nazis in this town would surrender to Jack and his men, and for his actions, Jack would be awarded the Distinguished Service Order. In 1944, Jack was in Yugoslavia with the commandos, trying to capture a strategically valuable location called Point 62. And when every man in his team was either killed or severely wounded, and when Jack had run out of arrows, instead of surrendering, he pulled out his bagpipes and started playing until a grenade detonated behind him, knocking him unconscious. The Nazis captured him and sent him to Berlin to be interrogated because they believed, because of his last name, Churchill, that he was connected to or related to the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill. He wasn't, not at all, so they ordered Jack to be sent to a concentration camp. On his way out of Berlin, Jack secretly flicked a lit cigarette butt into one of his interrogator's offices, and he lit it on fire, but nobody knew it was him. And so Jack arrives at this concentration camp, and he's only there for a couple of months before he and another British military officer managed to escape by crawling underneath one of the barbed wire fences. They had slowly burrowed a tunnel without anybody noticing, and then they jumped down into this abandoned drainage pipe, and they crawled out to freedom that way. But their freedom would be short-lived, because they only made it a couple of miles before they were recaptured by the Nazis. And so they were ordered to go to another concentration camp that was considered much more secure. But after only having been at this new concentration camp for less than a year, once again, Jack was able to escape. This time, it was because there was a power outage at the camp, and Jack just put a shovel down and casually walked out the front gates, and nobody noticed. He walked 150 miles in the treacherous terrain of the Alps, surviving on vegetables he had stolen from people's gardens, and then finally, eight days later, he came across a United States Armored Division, and they took him in and reconnected him with British troops, and then he was ultimately sent back to England. And while Jack was free, he was very frustrated that the war in Europe was effectively over, and he had missed most of it. And so he requested a transfer to go out to Burma to fight against the Japanese in the Pacific Theater, but as soon as he got there, the Americans had just dropped the atomic bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, Japan, abruptly ending World War II. And when Jack heard about this, he was so disappointed he would not get to do any more fighting, he was quoted as saying, Ah, if it wasn't for those Yanks, we could have kept this war going for another 10 years. 
Even though the war was over, Jack desperately wanted to get into combat at least one more time, and so he went to jump school and qualified as a parachutist at the age of 40, and with this new qualification, he was assigned to a light infantry unit, and they were deployed to Palestine to train their army how to better fight the Arab forces. And while he was there, he gained even more fame when he defended a Jewish medical convoy from an Arab ambush, and he did this all while wearing a kilt. Another time, he and 12 of his men helped evacuate 700 people from a Jewish hospital that was under attack from Arab forces. After Palestine, Jack came back to England and eventually retired from the army, and then begrudgingly took a desk job within the Ministry of Defense. And every day on his commute home on the train, he would take his briefcase and throw it out the window as they were moving. What he had figured out was if he threw it at the exact right moment, it would land in the backyard of his house, and he wouldn't need to carry his briefcase from the station to his house. But he didn't explain that to any of the other passengers on the train. They just figured there's some crazy guy who keeps throwing his briefcases out the window. In his retirement, he also became an extremely talented surfer. And at one point, he wanted to surf the Severn Boar, which is this huge wave in southwestern England that nobody else had surfed before. And locals that were familiar with this treacherous wave, they cautioned him and said, you really shouldn't do this. And he looked at them and he just said, eh, I'll be all right. And then he proceeded to be the first person ever to successfully ride that wave. Jack would ultimately die in 1996. He was 89 years old. So that's going to do it, guys. If you found the secret in today's episode, let us know in the comments what it is and where you found it. So give us a timestamp. And if you're the first to do that, we'll pin you at the top of the comments section. If you enjoyed today's video and you haven't done this already, please invite the like button to come out with you for a very casual get together. And when you're about halfway through dinner, start aggressively hard selling your multi-level marketing scheme. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly three or four video uploads. If you want to get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username for both platforms is the same. It's John Ballin 416 I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. I also have a second YouTube YouTube channel called Mr. Ball and Shorts, where I post random short videos. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, or some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.